Welcome to the Gamut of Performance Podcast, Episode 13. On this episode of the podcast, I get to talk to Coach Derek Hansen. I was fortunate enough to have visited Coach Hansen when he was the head strength coach at Simon Fraser. This was early on in my career, and I wasn't really sure what I was doing or what questions to ask, but he was very hospitable and treated me as a full-on coach, even though I was just an intern at the time. It's such a pleasure to be able to reconnect with Derek. He's such a smart coach and one of the people that I really look up to in the field. And so this podcast is really an honor to me. We get into sprint and plyo training, return to sport protocol, and electrical muscle stimulation. Derek Hansen is one of the smartest people I've had the pleasure of conversing with in person, as well as over media. And so without further ado, here's Coach Derek Hansen. Derek Hansen, thanks for being on today. Super excited to talk to you. Really appreciate your time. Um, for the listeners at home, will you just tell us a little bit about your background, how you got to where you are, and what your initial mo- motivation in the field was? Um, yeah, sure. Thank, thanks for having me on, Juan. Um, I, I think for me, mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of us, you know, don't really know. Like yeah. we just sort of you know gravitate towards things we like. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you if you had a uh, a positive athletic career, then I think you go, okay, this is something I'm interested in. And I think to some degree, if you had a pot, like positive enough, mm-hmm. but you thought I could have done better if I had organized my training properly. And yeah. not that my training was bad, but you're always thinking, okay, I could have done this differently. I could have once, once you get a little smarter. And of course, now that I'm almost 50 years old, mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh, I should have done everything completely <laughs> differently or, yeah. but, um, you don't really, you don't really get that chance while you're an athlete, right? Yeah. So I think some of it is you want to kind of undo the wrongs of your athletic career mm-hmm. and, um, you know, and you want to pass on this information to people and try to, try to help them, mm-hmm. which is, which is interesting. I think when you start, you're very altruistic and very, but dare I say naive, like you yeah. think, okay, I've, I've got all this great information. People will just eat it up. Mm-hmm. But there's the, there's a whole selling um, job that you have to do as part of that. You have to not just educate people as part of the process, but you have to gain trust and you have to, mm-hmm. um, you know, have a, a sort of an equal exchange, right? You yeah. can't just say, hey, this is my way. Mm-hmm. Let's just do it. So that that's the interesting part of all of this, I think especially as you get older, as you understand that, yes, it would be nice if everything was ideal, but honestly, it's never going to be ideal. There's always yeah. going to be things uh, that go wrong. Mm-hmm. And I think the the better coaches, and at least for me, the stuff that makes it interesting for me is, okay, how do we problem solve on the go? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I think my career has been athlete, mostly track coaching initially, mm-hmm where everything was quantifiable, yeah, um, very straightforward, not a lot of outside interference. Mm. And then into strength and conditioning where, okay, a lot more variables, mm. a lot less time, a lot less control, mm. um, more interaction with more people. Yeah. So okay. a little, you know, and there, there's positives there, but yeah. there's a lot of frustration as well. Okay, fair enough. And kind of on that point, right, so you, you initially started out in track and field and then went to the college setting and then back to consulting. Um, can you just talk about that transition and what made you uh, want to go back to consulting ultimately? Yeah, I, I think you start, again, if you're a track coach, you're kind of your own boss, mm-hmm. right? You have your athletes and everything is on you. Yeah. For the most part, unless, you know, some of the athletes have some uh, distractions and all that. So it, it was a very direct way of measuring your ability, right, to mm-hmm. coach. Um, and then, you know, during that time I did, you know, consulting and contract work with sports teams as well. Mm-hmm. Um, not 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 like what I'm doing now, but I did that and then eventually took a job at a university, mm-hmm. you know, as their first ever strength coach. And then I think, you know, again, you go in going, wow, I can make a huge contribution. Yeah. And then there's all these challenges <laughs> that arise, uh-huh. uh, mostly because you're dealing with more people. Definitely. And they have their own ideas, mm-hmm. right? They... Well, everybody, you know, on the surface, they say, well, yes, you can come in and you can handle strength and conditioning. Yeah. And then it's like, it doesn't really work yeah. that way. You have coaches that want, have an idea, mm. you know, they're the expert in their sport. Yeah. Um, 
for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem is now, if they heard that somebody else is doing something, there's this, you know, attributing success to that. So we did, um, like, there's a, there's a one team where they do half gassers as a test because the head coach had a good season when they did that. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. Um, or, you know, we, we have to do this exercise because I did it when I was an athlete. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so right off the bat, you, you know, either you have a choice. You compromise mm -hmm. or you get into a real pissing match and you may <laughs> – jeopardize your job right yeah. so i think you know after doing that for 14 <laughs> years of compromising a lot uh -huh. of stuff and dealing with um a lot of people who didn't do their research and mm -hmm. just did it out of emotion and wanted yeah. to have their way uh -huh. i think you can only take so much of that right yeah, no, if, if you are if you are the type of person who wants to make sure that the athletes get the best training and the best information mm. and you want to minimize injury and you're yeah. enhancing the safety of, of all the athletes. Yeah. Um, you know, you kind of take it to heart when people say, no, <laughs> we're going to do this instead just because I want to do it. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. there's no discussion, right? Yeah. There. So at some point you go, I can't be involved with this anymore. Um, you know, uh, you, I was hired to be an expert mm -hmm. in these areas, the physical preparation, the return to play, and uh, none of you want to participate in that in yeah. that way. You know, you're not deferring to me on any level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hey, that's the job. Yeah, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit sit here and go. Um, you know, it should be my way or the highway. But um, every, we all have choices in life, mm -hmm. and I decided I've had enough. Right. right? I um, I don't want to play this game anymore. Like mm -hmm. I have, you know, a certain amount of years ahead of me. Um, that I want to actually make a difference and do some positive things, and yeah. it's really not fulfilling in this current role. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's like that in all college and strength, strength and conditioning, mm -hmm. but there's certainly the same challenges for everybody, right? Yeah. And at some point, you have to go, okay, I just want a paycheck, yeah. and I'll just do, you know, what that coach wants, mm -hmm. um, and that's great. But for me, it wasn't. It really wasn't an option. Yeah. I, I just think there's so many. So many other things I, I want to tackle, and mm -hmm. kind of test myself in. Yeah. And I, I, I just didn't think that was the right environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did it. Like, you mm -hmm. know, I put in the time, put in my 14 years and said, yeah. okay, yeah. I, I think if I leave now, nobody's going to say, like, you, you, you kind of quit on the job. It's yeah. Like, yeah. I, yeah. 14 years is quite some time. So, yeah. 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 So, um, and I know there's other people in that scenario, too, mm -hmm. who, um, for better or for worse, they, you know, you have a lot of situations where, especially at the upper levels where you have basketball, football, mm -hmm. some of the higher level sports where coaches change. Yeah. And so you may have had a really good setup and you may have had really good communication with the coaching staff. And for whatever reason, you know, games were lost yeah. uh, at no fault of your own. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is, New coaching staff comes in, and a lot of times they'll just clear out all the strength and conditioning staff yeah. Yeah. Um, and bring in their own people. Mm -hmm. Okay, but other times they don't or they can't do that, and then it, it just doesn't gel well because yeah. I think there's an there's this inherent bias bias where people come in and just they want to paint everybody with the same brush and say, oh, well, you guys lost, yeah, so it's all it must your be fault. All of you, yeah, 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 no, I get that. So. Um, and so when that happens, you're like, geez, like, that's, that's not cool. Like yeah. if you were intelligent, you would assess the person <laughs> on their merit. Right. Uh -huh. Um, but that doesn't happen. And so, you know, what, what's, what's really kind of funny for me is that you'll see that you'll see the new, the coaching staff gets rid of, uh, the old staff mm -hmm. and then they bring in their new staff and, you know, for, you know, if they have character, they'll say, Hey, look, we're going to start something. You know, we, we want to do something new and different. But a lot of time you'll hear these undertones of like, oh, we're going to do a better job than those last guys. Yeah, yeah. Right? And that's really unnecessary. Mm. And then it really just uh, totally amuses me when the next group comes in and they have more injuries and they lose more <laughs> games. And they and it's like, okay, you know, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. So um, I think that's a real problem in the industry in terms mm. of um, – there's a sort of nepotism right now mm -hmm. that isn't Agreed. cool. Yeah. Like, and people say, well, you know, the coach has to be able to trust their guy, right? Yeah. 
And it was like, well, what are you trusting him with, yeah. right? We, every, it seems like every year in January, yeah, clockwork, you have a new staff come in, yeah, and you have players admitted to hospital because they're trying to set the tone, right? yeah, like, yeah. You know, you know, people getting rhabdo and kidney <laughs> problems. Uh -huh. So there, there's a problem right yeah. there that um, they're not understanding uh, what they really should be doing, which mm -hmm. is giving them the proper training and trying to understand, um, you know, the situation they're in. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And and a lot of the times, you know, it might just be that you didn't have the right players. Definitely. So yeah. So why are you punishing the staff because yeah. they didn't have the right players for, yeah. for whatever reason? And then you come in, and your training program is going to yeah. fix these non-talented <laughs> players. So yeah, that's the funniest Anyways. to me, right? Is like you get, you know, Joe Schmo over here, and you think I want this kid, like coach thing, I want this kid to be an all-star. It's not really going to happen, right? You know, so that's a really good point. No, very rarely. Like if there was, you know, if there was something seriously wrong with his yeah. physical preparation, yeah, um, sure, but. Um, you know that doesn't really happen that often. You you're kind of playing the cards that you're dealt with, mm -hmm. and if if you have you know if you don't have any cards that match or aren't the same color or yeah. you know it, you're going to have a crappy hand yeah. until you um, go to the next uh, the next shuffle. So yeah. I don't know. It's 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 there's a lot of oversimplification going mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people right now are talking about how sports science is going to fix this. Mm -hmm. But the definition of, or the interpretation of what sports science is, everybody thinks it's technology. Yeah. But sports science should be like a really, you know, um, objective approach to how you do everything. Yeah. Right. In terms of accountability, in terms of how you identify and select players. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there can be some technology that, that's part of that. Mm -hmm. But just because you're using spreadsheets and GPS <laughs> doesn't mean you're practicing sports science. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that, that's really interesting. And that's a good point, right? So. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question that probably everyone asks you about. And so uh, you often reference like Charlie Francis and, and Alvin Meal, right? Will you talk about some of your time spent working with them and some of your biggest takeaways? Yeah, like the the thing with Charlie, mm -hmm. and I started working with him in 2001. Mm -hmm. um, there's like there's some videos that I have yeah. that I'm I'm going to be re releasing with his wife. Mm -hmm. And um, the great thing is that when you listen to him, he made makes perfect sense on every point. Yeah. He's not he's not basing his conclusions on a guess or yeah. you know trying to sensationalize anything. It's based on okay, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. This is how we dealt with it. This is the result. Yeah. Um and he was very so straightforward about that stuff that it was refreshing at, at the time and even yeah. now, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I think there that's what's lacking right now is that there's not this common sense approach. Uh, there's a lot of guessing, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of sensationalizing things that really uh, were the result of your intervention. It's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, we're great, right? So, yeah. Well, again, you got great players. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, that was the thing that I learned from him is he's very meticulous. Okay. Um, but at the same time, he was very adaptable in terms of how he did things. If he saw something that didn't look right, mm -hmm. he would be the first one to say, like, okay, let's abandon this plan and let's yeah. try something else. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I think is missing now is okay. that adaptability, yeah, uh, or that willingness to be adaptable. Mm -hmm. Everybody's like, okay, I want to see your annual program all in a spread again, a spreadsheet, yeah, yeah. Uh, sports Microsoft science, right? Excel. Like uh, you know, when I first learned how to coach, uh -huh. nobody mentioned spreadsheets or Microsoft Excel, yeah. but but that everybody thinks because they've written it down uh -huh. and because the numbers add up uh -huh. that it's a good program or it's, yeah. it's going to be a successful plan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I, 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 I hate to break it to you, but that has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Um, certainly, uh, I got the impression from working with Charlie that he mm -hmm. didn't plan anything in terms of that type of approach. Like he yeah. wasn't, he was horrible with computers <laughs> and uh, his math was horrible, <laughs> but he had a general sense of uh, where everything was going to be at any given time. So okay. he knew that going into this week, he knew what they did last week. We did, you know, 450 meters of speed per day. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll up that by, you know, 50, maybe it'll yeah. go up to 500. Mm -hmm. And he knew what times they ran and he knew what deficiencies needed to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And this week we're going to work on that. Yeah. And he knew that if that was three months out from a competition, mm -hmm. he knew roughly where he wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, there was not a lot of uh, conventional pre-planning done. It was all okay. sort of, okay, it was feel, it mm -hmm. was talking to the athlete, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, if you presented to that them, to them and you said his approach was, his planning was very conceptual, like, yeah. you know, here, this is what we're going to cover, then here, then here, and we knew roughly what numbers were going to happen. Mm -hmm. But it made it easier to have that approach. It was almost like drawn on in a graphic. Yeah. Because um, you, you see some of the material that we produce. And then, then he goes, okay, let's go. Let's, yeah. let's go from there. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I, I don't think people feel comfortable doing that nowadays. Mm -hmm. I think they feel like it has to be written down. Yeah. We have to follow it. Mm -hmm. And you'll even have college coaches like have everything written on cards yeah. and you hand it out to the athlete. Yeah. And uh, cool. I mean, I did that too, yeah. right? Like I, I planned everything out. Uh -huh. and this is the next 16 weeks of training. This is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I think you need that to, today for some level of credibility. Yeah, it's smoke right? and mirrors, right? Yeah, like, okay, here's my plan, mm -hmm. right? And everybody looks at it, hey, look, there's numbers, there's exercises, yeah. there's colors, <laughs> great. Um, but, you know, when we went to implement that, yeah. I was changing stuff all the time, like yeah. on the fly, on uh -huh. the, in the weight room. Like if I saw something different, okay, you're not doing that, you're doing it this way, yeah. right? Which is a lot of work for yeah. you to to make those changes. Oh, no, um, definitely, yeah. But you have to. I mean, again, it goes back to, uh, you know, are you secure enough with yourself to go? Yes, that's what we initially planned, but we're going to change it for these reasons. And a lot yeah. of people don't feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. Um, and then you also have because if there's one of you, like I always empowered my staff to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this is the plan, guys. You're smart enough to know if this guy is, you know, not making his totals, yeah. he has to either shorten the sets mm -hmm. or change the weight or change the exercise. And mm -hmm. I give you that freedom, right? And that's what made them better coaches. Well, they, they had to think on their feet mm -hmm. and make the right decision on the day. Yeah. And I think that is something that's sorely missed nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, Agreed. So um, that's what I got from Charlie. Mm -hmm. And then for Al Vermeil, you know, I, I got to know Al through Charlie. Mm -hmm. Um, because they had worked together back in like the late eighties with the Chicago Bulls. And okay. I st I can have, Al has video of them yeah. like sitting in the boardroom talking in 1988 mm -hmm. doing stuff. Hopefully I can ask Al if we can release that too, because it's pretty interesting. Okay. Um, but you know, from Al, he was had a very comprehensive organized approach as well. Uh -huh. Um, where, you know, he had brought in every expert of the time. Uh, into the Bulls facility, and again, there's videos of him with like Mel Sif and um, uh, uh, what's the guy's name, uh, Javorak. Okay. And uh, um, from um, he was with USA Weightlifting, um, Dragomir, okay, Roslin doing lifts yeah. and all that. Yeah, Lee, okay. All, all of these experts yeah. were brought in, and there was discussion, and it was all captured on video. Yeah. And so he was never the kind of guy to just go, oh, I know everything. Let's just mm. do it Yeah, my way. He uh -huh. was always pushing the envelope, and that's what I got. And even now, he'll call me up, and we'll have a discussion. And yeah. he'll ask questions, and I'll ask questions to him, and it's just back and forth, and he's yeah. in his 70s, right? So he he has this inherent um, need to learn and know mm. and, and, and bring people into the fold, Yeah, which is, you know, which is tough, too. There's a lot of strength coaches out there that just go with what, you know, this is what I have, this is what I'm going with, this uh -huh. is my philosophy, and I don't want to think about any other input from anybody else. Yeah. You know, having said that, there's a lot of strength and conditioning programs now that are actually, you know, they're getting me involved. Mm -hmm. We'll do Skype conversations with the staff. Yeah. And everybody, there's 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 obviously a, a proportion of them out there that want to learn mm -hmm. and that want to be challenged with new concepts. And so that's that's really for refreshing to see. Yeah. And some of them have been from big schools too. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to know that you know it's not just the small school who wants to get better; it's the big school who wants to continue to be successful. Yeah. Um. So that that that's sort of heartening on my mm -hmm. part that you know they want to tap into some of the stuff that maybe I learned from Charlie or Al. Yeah. So no, that's awesome. Um. And so going back to the physical preparation piece, will you? kind of just talk a little bit about speed training and uh, how to manage that and some key factors in that along with um, like the high-low high model? Yeah. Uh, again, 
if you're a track coach, usually you have a lot of ideas about how much volume you're going to do and how you're going to progress. With Charlie, everything was done in the short to long approach. Like you start with like 10 meter sprints and then you work out from there, 20, yeah. 30, 40, 50, 60. Mm -hmm. And then you're always thinking about what is the demand of your sport and what energy system you're trying to hit, what's mm -hmm. the position you're looking at in terms of posture and how you accelerate. So for more, most team sports, speed is very easy mm -hmm. because you don't really run that far. Mm -hmm. So your speed, your speed program is very, um, I would say acceleration mm -hmm. based. Okay. And I think if you, if you just focus on acceleration, mm -hmm. um, you're probably going to be okay. So yeah. basketball, even if you did repeat 10 meter sprints, mm -hmm. you're probably okay because yeah. there's not a lot of hard acceleration in basketball. Like uh -huh. there is acceleration, but if you accelerate too long in basketball, you're going to run into the, you know, the stands, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, that's easy. Soccer, you a little farther out. Um, but even even if you watch a World Cup, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of full-out long sprinting. It's very yeah. short. It's The passing is very precise, right? Agreed, yeah. So uh, in football, by position, you might have linemen who go no farther than five yards, mm -hmm. if that. Um, you may have um, running backs that go 10, you know, 5, 10, 15. Maybe they break a longer run. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, the receivers and the uh, uh, special teamers who go farther. Yeah. So you're just structuring all of your work around, okay, what is what is necessary for them to be successful and safe in their sport? Yeah. And that's what you build your program around. Whereas if you're doing a 100-meter, 200-meter, 400-meter runner, mm -hmm. then you get into other energy systems. It's just not all alactic. It's... You know, there's speed endurance components. Um, there's special endurance components where you're getting out to 30, 40, 45 seconds and beyond. Mm -hmm. And then it gets a little more complicated in combining acceleration, max velocity, speed endurance, special endurance. Okay. So you're, you're dividing that over the week. You're going, well, maybe we'll focus on speed this day. We'll focus on speed endurance this day. Um, and then we'll focus on longer stuff another day. Mm -hmm. But for team sports, if you're a strength and conditioning coach, you're basically doing acceleration. Yeah. You may change the distances a little bit, and you may change the way you start. Okay. Right? So mm -hmm. that, that was a big thing for me is that I came up with this concept of you're either doing a soft start or a hard start. Mm -hmm. And a soft start is falling into it, walking into it, rolling mm -hmm. into it, uh, something that doesn't take a lot of stress and energy to okay. create propulsion, right? Yeah. So that, that if I do a soft start, they tend to be more relaxed and they mm -hmm. can use their energy for the run. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I have them do a three point start or start off a push up position or I have them push a medicine ball and sprint, mm -hmm. that's more of a hard start. Okay. Where it takes more energy to get yourself off the line. Gotcha. And that'll be the emphasis really is have a good start and mm -hmm. then finish with an acceleration. Okay. But I know in, in track and field when we did block starts, uh, starting blocks, we didn't go much farther than 20, 30, meters with block starts mm -hmm. because we wanted to focus on that quality but then when we did our longer run 60 80 100 150 there were from falling starts or walk-in starts yeah because we wanted the energy to go to the run mm -hmm. so okay. even just making that distinction is important in okay. terms of um because i think a lot of people in football go everything's a three points there yeah yeah and it's like well watch the game uh, only a few guys are coming out of a three-point stance, and yeah. they're not sprinting straight out of it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, that that's that's where if I'm working with a, a NFL or college team, I'll say like you have to classify your starts, and you have to have a progression of how you do it, and mm -hmm. um, you know you can do some hard starts this day, which is more compatible with what you're doing in the weight room, yeah, or with med ball throws, and then on the other day, I want everything softer. I mm -hmm. want everybody feel relax mm -hmm. and maybe that coincides with maybe your recovery work or yeah. your your tempo work on mm -hmm. another day so okay. you know I'm, I'm very um, cognizant of what the demands of the sport are and then yeah. how we should kind of progress that out with yeah. their program their training program but okay. the the most important thing is you want people working at at least a 90 95 100 percent range mm -hmm. of their best time because if they don't run fast, they really won't yeah. get faster. Like there's, <laughs> That's so there's simple, a lot of yeah. talk about, oh, you could just train these things submaximally and yeah. then, you know, it'll be there. And I mean, 
sure, you're training sub-maximally a lot mm-hmm. of the time, but you're still working around the edges where, you know, they have to put some effort into it. They have to test themselves. Yeah. Uh-huh. The worst thing you could do is train somebody at 80% and then expect them to be at 100% Yeah. on game day. Uh-huh. It'll feel so foreign and so different. That's a good so, point. Okay. So with that, right, so what are some guidelines with, say, um, the difference of using, like, plyos and, and uh, yardage in track and field with team sports? Does that make sense? Uh, sorry, plyos uh, for... Yeah, so what are, like, the difference? Like, how would you differently um, use plyos in track and field versus team sports? And, and like, what's that differentiator? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I had a book that I wrote, Plyometric Anatomy. Oh, which yeah, that's I'll good. I'll plug book. right now. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is just exercises, right? Uh-huh. Um, which is fine. And then I, if people buy the book, then I send them sort of a planning chapter. Yeah. Um, but I think, again, if you're looking at team sports, mm-hmm. there's – there's different applications of using plyos. Like in track and field, mm-hmm. the plyos don't have to be lateral. They don't have to have any sort yeah. of uh, multi-directional movement component. So in team sports, I'm using plyos in that way mm-hmm. to address that, right? You know, people want to do a lot of direction change and um, agility. And a lot of the time I'll address that with plyos. If people can be reactive off the ground, it's going to help the direction change. Right, without mm-hmm. having to do all the repetition and wear and tear of doing, yeah. you know, cone drills all the time. So, mm-hmm. whereas in track and field, a lot of the time I'm focusing on elasticity, okay. and ground contact time. Oh, okay. Um, and so I want it to be relatively close. Like it's not going to be close to maximum velocity, which is yeah. you know at the highest level, it's less than a tenth of a second yeah. for ground <laughs> contact time. Okay. Right. Uh huh. So. Average average athlete probably about a tenth of a second to you know twelve one hundredths of a second fourteen one hundredths of a second. Mm. So even with plyos, like say you're doing hurdle jumps and box jumps, you're getting into like two tenths of a second, three three tenths of a second, mm. maybe longer. It depends on the jump. So it's not the same, but it's you know it's, in many regards it's close enough. Mm. Um, so I might have. You know, it depends on what your your uh, intent is. If I want them to be elastic, I'm keeping the hurdles pretty low, mm-hmm. and I'm working on quality of ground contact, yeah. um, light and quick. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I want them to be explosive or I want to tap and even kind of to a maximum recruitment and max strength quality, mm-hmm. you might do more box jumps, mm-hmm. like jumps up, concentric jumps, but also depth jumps, yeah. which have longer ground contact times. Mm-hmm. So there's – and then with all of this – there is a general systemic effect of doing these things that make you stronger, you know, more yeah. fit yeah. and uh, more able to handle loads. Mm-hmm. So in track and field, probably a little more precise to what's happening on the track or yeah. if you're doing long jump or triple jump. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, we'll probably do a lot more bounding mm-hmm. um, and, you know, hopping and bounding combinations in track and field. Mm-hmm. Whereas in team sports, not the same skill set. Yeah. So I might do that if I have um, athletes that are able to, you know, do those types of movements. But mm-hmm. I'm not taking 300 pound linemen and have me to do hopping and bounding yeah, yeah, all the yeah. time. That makes sense. If I did, yeah. I would probably have to do it uphill because okay. it's a little easier to do that. Oh, okay. But um, yeah, I, I would say my plyos in a team sports setting tend to be more acyclical. Mm-hmm. They tend to be. Um, you know, have a multi-directional component focusing on concentric qualities, but also eccentric qualities more so than, than the track athlete because, mm-hmm. you know, they have to stop, they have to change direction. Yeah. Um, and then we'll kind of blend in use of medicine balls with that as, as well. So you mm-hmm. might have jump, jump, throw, or jump sideways, throw the other way mm-hmm. um, because I just like, um, I like the medicine ball just for explosive work yeah. and, it just adds a dimension. It's it's kind of closer to team sports in terms mm-hmm. of contact, and, um, having your hands on something. So. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Um, and so moving forward, right? So the speed reserve is vastly important, and I know you've talked about this a lot. Um, so how do coaches mess this up, right? So whether it's in track and field or whether it's in team sports, how do um, coaches mess up like training that speed reserve? The most common. I mean, I think they they're. A lot of coaches just chase specificity, right? Okay. So if they think something is, uh, if they think a, a soccer game is 90 minutes, yeah. 
then we're going to run for 90 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to, like even with MMA, there Uh are fighters I work with who their training regime was basically doing, you know, three to five sets of five five minutes, Mm -hmm. right? So they would they would try to say, okay, this is how long a round is, yeah, um, and uh, this is how long we're gonna go, right? Mm-hmm. And they would do weights for five minutes, and the rest for a minute, and do weights for five minutes. Yeah. So people chasing specificity is problematic because, as you know, in the midst of of that five minutes or that ninety minute soccer game, there's explosive efforts, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And you can get knocked out in the first ten seconds of a fight. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Unless you break things down and work on, you know, producing force and being fast for shorter periods, mm-hmm. um, you're not going to, you know, cover all of the bases that you need to cover. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is that if you um, are very strong, very fast, that you can actually operate at lower levels okay. of velocity, and it's very easy yeah. for you, right? So yeah, if yeah. you if you're Usain Bolt, you got to run around at eight meters per second. Yeah. That's really easy if you're used to 12. Yeah. So, um, which is interesting because he's playing soccer now, so it's interesting oh, to see oh, yeah. how, how that works out. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I just think, you know, yes, if you have endurance as part of your sport, uh-huh. sure, train that over here, mm-hmm. but then recognize that you have to train maximally in speed and power mm-hmm. uh, on the other side, and then that stuff will blend when, the, when, you, when you practice the game. Yeah. But as strength and conditioning coaches, our job is not to simulate the game mm, because they're yeah. doing that already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I get in, I get into these arguments with people about agility, and mm. we need to do more agility because it's like the game. Yeah, but you guys practice two to three hours a day already, yeah. uh-huh. and that's as specific as it needs to be. Yeah, right. So you're changing direction in the way that you need to change direction. Mm-hmm. We're not creating some artificial you know, some zigzag pattern yeah, that yeah. never happens on the field. Definitely. So. Why don't we just improve um, force output qualities, ground mm-hmm. contact times through plyo sprinting? Yeah, you know, general force production qualities in the weight mm-hmm. room, and then yes, we'll do some field based stuff, mm-hmm. right? There, there has to be a bridge to connect them to what happens in practice. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't. You're not simulating what happens in practice. You're not, yeah. you know, and that's the thing. I have football coaches telling strength coaches like, oh, you have to do. Um, I, you got to run patterns with them. You yeah. have to do exactly what the defensive backs do. Well, isn't that your job? Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. So, uh, because then now you have somebody who doesn't really understand football uh-huh. trying to teach a football thing, or they don't understand what the objectives of the, the coaching staff is mm-hmm. in terms of how the defense integrates with this movement, how the offense you know flows with that type of movement. Yeah. So, uh, I just think you get into some real difficult situations when you, you know, have the strength coach try to be a sports specific specialist. Yeah. And and conversely you have sport coaches trying to be strength coaches. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's where it falls apart. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um so moving forward, right? So you've often tagged this like be the hashtag, right? That's one of your like Instagram things you've been working on that. So can you just talk a little bit about um when you initially started that, where that came from and, and uh where you see it going? Yeah, like I, I was, um, you know, a lot of it started back when I was an athlete and there was a coach I had, he was uh, uh, Czechoslovakian, and he, yeah. he talked about how things should line up, right? Okay. So if you're producing force with this leg, your opposite arm should be balanced with that leg, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it always stuck in the back of my mind in terms of bounding and sprinting and all that. And I never really followed up on it in terms of like saying, you know, here's how it should look. Yeah. Um, and then I was in New York last year, um, and working with, um, it was just, it was just a young athlete that one of the trainers at the gym at drive 495 that was, I was helping out at. And they, they said, Oh, you want to look at this kid and watch him sprint? And I had just, I'd been using my iPad with Dartfish Express. Okay. I was fooling around with it because yeah. I'd had that app for a while and I hadn't really used it. Yeah. Um, but I had an iPad that did it. It was a bigger format. And this, this kid was doing sprints and acceleration. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And I just started drawing lines on it, like freezing the video, drawing lines on it. And um, I think I started with like three lines. So a couple, I think it was the arms, a horizontal line with the arms, mm-hmm. the knee lift, and then a vert- vertical line for extension with okay. the back foot. Yeah. 
And I think somebody said, oh, you could probably add another line here yeah. with the shin angle, right? And I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. That's a hashtag, right? Yeah. So it was just sort of not accidental, but yeah. it's sort of like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And then so I just posted it to be the hashtag yeah. because the, the athlete that I was working with yeah. understood it right away. Yeah. Right. And I don't know if it's the hashtag reference or he yeah. just saw the lines and uh -huh. how it should line up. Yeah. And there's some variability. Like, let's be honest. There's some variability in there. Some people may not drive the arm the same way. Like, even uh -huh. Usain Bolt kind of drives his arms in kind of tight to his torso. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's so tremendously strong in the lower body. Yeah. Um, so there's some variability there. But I would say 95% of the time, mm -hmm. um, if people are doing it right, they will match up with those lines. Mm -hmm. Right. And if people yeah. have, like, I was doing it for the guys running the NFL Combine 40, mm -hmm. and all the guys running like 4 3, 4 2, whatever, yeah. you know, they all lined up really nicely at yeah. any stage of that run, the acceleration, the max velocity. Yeah. And then they had Rich Eisen, mm -hmm. and Rich Eisen's look like, you know, just a mess, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Because he doesn't have the output yeah. uh, to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's, that's how it started. And then, uh, I'm supposed to be presenting at the NSCA next week at okay. the national conference, and it's it's basically using sprint training as a way to screen and mm. identify deficiencies. Yeah, and, and you know I'm going to introduce this concept there and say, look, we can get really specific. Like we can say it has to be this angle, mm -hmm. and at this point when they're on the ground, they have to be here, and the arm should be here, and it should be this angle, and uh, I mean, that's nice. It's nice if you can analyze it to that detail mm -hmm. um, and maybe, you know, have attached numbers to it, and have like, a, you know, like an FMS total for sprinting. Yeah. And I've, I've looked at that, but it's very time consuming and it's not necessary. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So if I can video somebody and say, this is where you have to be, show them the hashtag, uh -huh. you know, people get it yeah. uh, a lot easier. And so why not have a very simplified way of, showing what you're looking for for the athlete mm -hmm. and everybody has a phone yeah that's and true that's Dart true dartfish express costs i don't know five bucks and so what what I, I i've had high school coaches and teachers come up to me and say that really helps yeah because now the kids get it and it's easy for me i'm not a sophisticated coach so you know as soon as i showed the kids that and mm -hmm. what you should look like they started to hit that yeah technique right mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it was just sort of an accidental thing. And I, yeah. I, I think it, it, as long as it's helping people, yeah, it, it may not be uh, one size fits all, but mm -hmm. it's pretty close. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. um, gravity is gravity and That's the human true. body doesn't change that much. So, yeah. um, if you can hit those positions, you're probably doing pretty good. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and so you've also done a lot of, a lot of research with like electrical muscle stimulation, right? Um, so can you talk a little bit about about how this resource has been misused in the past or present? Um, I, I just think it, it tends to be used in more of a rehab medicine mm -hmm. domain. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, you know, most rehab people know it, don't know how to use it properly, but mm -hmm. I think it's very passive. Okay. Um, so uh, the main the main function in a rehab sense a lot of the time will be like pain mitigation. Mm -hmm. So they would gravitate towards like tens, interferential, mm -hmm. um, which are kind of higher frequency, kind of you know settles things down and interferes with the pain signal, and that's great. That's there's value in that, right? Mm -hmm. But where I'm using it is more in like recruiting muscle. Um, uh, so either you're having hard contractions to target uh, fast twitch or slow twitch muscles, depending okay. on the frequency you select. Yeah. Um, to either strengthen mm -hmm. because you want to get better or in return to play scenarios, for some reason that muscle isn't firing the way you want it to. Yeah. Uh, maybe because of some noxious stimulus, maybe because you just, you know, come out of surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then superimposing that with exercise. So let's get the stim to contract when you do a step up or a squat. Okay. And I found that to be very valuable to kind of accelerate the process, mm -hmm. not accelerate it artificially, but just, you know, give people confidence to, yeah. to do voluntary exercise. Oh, okay. Um, and then on the recovery side, uh, you use it to pulse muscle mm -hmm. to increase mostly circulation. Like it does bring down muscle tone too. Yeah. But mostly, um, you know, movement helps to generate circulation. So 
if you're on a plane, so some of the pro athletes that use a stem that I advise or teams, if you're on a plane or a bus, yeah. or you're just sitting in a meeting for a long period of time, there's a definite value in having your circulation facilitated by EMS during these periods. And then mm. when you get up, you don't feel stiff. You don't feel yeah. lethargic. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then I, you know, I, I, I talked to a fellow who, um, promotes the send cells, the firefly device, which you put on your perineal nerve on your mm. calf there. And it, it kind of does the same thing. It's like a disposable unit. And I like that too. Like okay. that's pretty simple. Like if you yeah. don't want to buy units for everybody, the whole team, then you have these things, they stick them on during the flight mm -hmm. and it flushes out your, it flushes out like 30% of the, the fluid that's uh, sort of accumulating in your mm. lower legs. Okay. And, you know, awesome, right? Yeah. So I, I just think the education part hasn't been there to mm. give people confidence to really utilize it because it seems a little odd, like driving electricity into my body. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's definitely a, an acclimation phase to yeah. getting used to that. But, yeah. I mean, I've been doing it for 25 years. And, okay. Um. Yeah, everybody I use it with, I use it. My parents have back pain. Mm -hmm. oh, here, try this. Loosen yeah. this up. Oh yeah, that worked. Yeah, my kids, you know, uh, you know, their knee hurts, so I'm trying to loosen up or fire up the VMO. Mm -hmm. Hey, that works, right? Yeah. So it does work. Um, there's obviously other ways to do it, but mm -hmm. this, it's it, you get results pretty quickly, and you don't need a, a whole lot of skill. Okay, you just have to, you know. And I'm doing these little. I have these little videos. They're like 60 second videos on Instagram where mm -hmm. I'm doing like a little mini master class and just yeah. say, you know, here's 60 seconds about EMS. You know, mm -hmm. how do you use it? How do you use it safely? And I'm hoping that kind of gets out to people and they yeah. go, oh, okay, mm -hmm. that's not too difficult. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. That's good. And so you tested a little bit on return to play protocols, right? So can you talk a little bit about that and um, how, say, in the college setting, strength coaches can collaborate better with athletic trainers? Yeah, I think. I mean, uh, there has to be integration and collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's a lot of athletic trainers who have their CSCS, mm -hmm. which is great, yeah. right? There's not a lot of strength coaches who necessarily have, you know, rehab designations, which is fine. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need that to be useful. Yeah. But we all understand that you can't put somebody on a, a treadmill or a, a you know, on a table and then say, okay, you're ready. Let's put you on the field. There's yeah. a transition step there somewhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, I don't necessarily call it a transition step. I call it a continuum. Yeah. There's a continuum from when they get on that table to when they get on the field mm -hmm. and maybe they're on the table more in the beginning. And then at the end they're on the field more, mm -hmm. but somewhere in between there's this sort of, they're on the table, they're on the field, they're in the weight room, they're in the pool, they're, you know, they're doing all of these things. And mm -hmm. I think this, you know, it has to work both ways. You have to have strength coaches that are comfortable with doing stuff with in injured players in yeah. a progressive manner. But then you also have athletic trainers who will hand off these athletes to the strength coach with confidence and go, mm -hmm. okay, you know, you do your stuff now. And mm -hmm. We'll still do a little bit of our stuff, but we'll work together and we'll communicate on yeah. this. But that doesn't happen very easily. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the guys that I uh, were, were mentored by, like Rob Panarello, uh -huh. Don Chu, yeah. did both. They were both coaches, strength coaches, performance coaches, but they also were physical therapists. So mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of second nature to me, mm -hmm. but it may not be for somebody who just has done athletic yeah. training or has just done is just a strength coach, right? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. But even as a strength coach, you have to have, uh, I'll say this, you have to have diverse qualifications and, mm -hmm. and experience to be able to handle um, return to play. Like, you can't just be a weight room guy. Yeah. You have to understand how to move, how to run, how mm -hmm. to do things on the field in a progressive manner. And that, maybe that's that's where people fall short. They don't have that education. Yeah. So with, with my hamstring protocol, it's all sprint-based. Yeah. And, you know, I was at the NFL Combine this mm -hmm. past year actually teaching the athletic trainers, the NFL athletic trainers from PFATS, like, this is how I do it with sprint base. Yeah. Um, and to a lot of people, that's shocking. Like, well, they pulled their hamstring by sprinting. Why are we sprinting? That seems mm -hmm. counterintuitive. Yeah. But it works. 
it works really well. Mm-hmm. There's there's players that I've gotten back in four, five, six days wow. when usually it takes them three to four weeks. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, you have to even think from an evolutionary point of view that if you can't, you know, get up and go mm-hmm. uh, after a minor injury, you're dead, right? <laughs> yeah. So simple terms, yeah. Um, yeah. So there, there is, you know, the, you know, I understand that you have to rest people mm-hmm. and that you, um, you know, but look at what the the history has been with injuries. Like there was a lot of immobilization and casting yeah. Yeah. for joints and things, mm-hmm. and now we're figuring out, no, you got to move. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, even ACL rehab, like, you know, from what I learned from Rob Panarello, mm-hmm. you have to be progressive and you have to be uh, intelligently aggressive, yeah. right? Because um, if you don't, you miss windows of opportunity in that rehab um, and you're going to have problems later on. It's going to haunt you. So, yeah. and I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of um, competency-based rehab, Okay. right? Or return to play. I don't use rehab a lot anymore because you're not a rehab professional. Okay, well I'm a rehab <laughs> return to play specialist. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. But but it's competency based, right? Uh-huh. So at any at any given time in the rehab process, I should be able to say where you are in okay. that continuum of rehab. Mm-hmm. Like I know that you're exactly four weeks away, or mm-hmm. two weeks, or three days. And so when you see stuff, and maybe some of this stuff is just to hide. Um, you know, the truth, but it, you'll see an injury report. It's like this guy's day to day. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. What is day to day mean? What, yeah. Like, nobody knows what that means. Right. Is, is he magically going to be better like yeah. tomorrow? Yeah. Um, whereas in hamstring rehab, if I'm doing a sprint based approach, I know exactly how fast he can run, mm-hmm. how far he can run yeah. asymptomatically. Um, and so we're confident. Like I know if we're six days in and he's mm-hmm. running 20 yards at, 85, 90%, mm-hmm. I know it's probably going to take us another four or five days yeah. to clear him, right? Definitely. Um, just based on experience. Mm-hmm. Now, if you don't have that experience, you know, you got to engage the process and you got to do this to understand how it works. Mm-hmm. You can't just go, no, we're not going to do that. Yeah. Because now you got a guy sitting on the bench or in the training room mm-hmm. for another four weeks. Mm-hmm. And if that guy's getting paid, millions of you know tens of millions of dollars a year mm-hmm. that's money left on the table so. yeah no it seems super intuitive when you talk about it right like we got to move to get better and then using that that uh strategy we we know where we are even more so it makes sense but for whatever reason you know a lot of people are stuck in their way strength coaches as well and so that's a really good point yeah i've never seen anybody get better by sitting <laughs> down or laying in bed maybe yeah. if you have the flu but yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> it's a little right yeah like, you know, no, you need bed rest yeah. until you're ready to play in the playoffs. Right? Yeah, <laughs> doesn't work. Doesn't that make way. sense, right? Um, so with that, right? So recently, the NCAA has made this new rule um, allowing like basketball coaches to have access to their players over the summer, right? So what's what's your take on this? What can we expect to see as a result of this? Oh, you know, I, I haven't. I've heard about that. I yeah. don't know all the details. Was there okay. a reason given? Um, why they wanted? As far as I know, I'm I'm not positive of any reasoning, so I don't I don't know anything as far as that. I just know that coaches are allowed. I believe it's um, two hours per day, so I think it's an eight hour week total. And I could be wrong on those details, but it's a significant amount of time, you know. And that 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 could be used for practice. Yes, and so they're you're doing full practices, you know, whatever, basically whatever they want. Wow. Um, yeah, not good. Um, <laughs> I, I would say, you know, I, I would preface that with. It could be okay. okay. Like if you had a coach who understood that, okay, we're going to use it to work on some skill work. Yeah. We might do uh, some some sets where we get to walk through or run through some things, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but if you, you're giving them like, you know, eight to ten more hours a week, mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of that's going to be scrimmages and mm-hmm. full, you know, full on team stuff. Yeah. Which I worry about because, again, whenever. I was doing stuff with basketball, like they would say, okay, we're going to practice and we're going straight to the weight room. Yeah. But the practice was always, you know, finished with some sort of running punishment. Mm-hmm. And then they go to the weight room and the guy's like, I can't lift. I'm just yeah. so tired. Yeah. And so you're always backing off. Mm-hmm. So you're diluting uh, that session. Mm-hmm. And that's what I would, that's my biggest concern with uh, this proposal would be the basketball coach's mentality is that the only way we can get better is to do more basketball. Yeah. 
right? I don't discount that. Like, mm-hmm. I understand that there's certain things you got to work on. Mm-hmm. But even with my son, like, he does multi-sports. He's, like, 13 years old. He does multi-sports. And so he played, like, flag football this spring, didn't do any basketball. Mm-hmm. And then we went on the court and did some things. I'm like, wow, he's better. Yeah. Like, his, his coordination is better. His mm-hmm. He's making shots. He has more strength. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not necessarily um, true that you have to keep doing a sport to get better at it. You could do something different and come back, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, I would have concerns. Yeah. I would, you know, if I were a strength coach, you know, and again, you want to watch – um, watch where you step and what what you say, mm-hmm. but I think part of that meeting would be how do we make sure that we do this in the correct way to not over you know, use mm-hmm. their bodies in a certain way and create stress injuries. And, yeah, and that's you know that's the conversation we have a lot about the NBA. Is mm-hmm. it seems there's more uh, injuries like. Yeah. I don't know. I'm like old school. Like mm-hmm. I used to watch Jordan, Michael Jordan getting mugged yeah. by the Detroit Pistons. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Nobody missed many games. Like yeah. you'd see, oh, that guy got hammered. Yeah. And like very so physical. Were, yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. physical. Mm-hmm. And guys were not missing games or yeah. out for the entire season. But yeah. now, you know, I mean, I know the same two teams have been in the playoffs, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the last five years, but, mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of teams who are devastated by injuries. And yeah. Guys couldn't play. Like, uh, was it from Houston? The uh, guy that Chris pulled Paul. his hamstring. Yeah, Chris Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you think that affected the outcome? Sure. Yeah, most um, definitely. So, uh, you know, until until we figure out, okay, how do we how do we manage this stuff mm-hmm. and make sure we get the right amount of strength and conditioning? Um, and make sure these guys are stressed in different ways, mm-hmm. then I think we're going to have problems. We're going to see yeah. more injuries. We're going to see yeah. more teams devastated and not seeing their potential because of this, right? Yeah. Um, obviously, you don't see the same in college mm-hmm. because they, they have had this offseason, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But who knows? Maybe with this change, yeah. you're going to see more injuries. So yeah. that's that's something I would keep track of. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's NCAA injury stats for mm-hmm. basketball yeah. where they keep track of this, but... I would certainly like to see what happens. Yeah. I mean, and the problem is not going to happen this season. Mm-hmm. The problem is going to happen three years from now. Definitely. Yeah. Um, where it really is mm-hmm. a problem. Having said that, um, in the NFL, the, the collective bargain agreement after the 2011 collective bargain agreement where they mm-hmm. shrunk off season workouts, I mean, they saw it right away. ACLs went from 40 to 65 or something. Yeah. Like that. So interesting. Um, so yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm curious to see. It. Yeah. I'm not a fan. Yeah, uh, because it, it's it's so open to abuse. Mm-hmm. And I agree. And and there could be some reasoning, you know, that necessary that I didn't read or or understand correctly, you know. But overall, you know, more time. That's now they're going almost all year round. You know, back just like a high school or a, yeah, like a kid in high school going AAU right, playing all around, and you see a rise in injury rates. So I can only assume similar statistics, but. Uh, so, yeah, one of my one of my mm-hmm. friends in the NBA is an athletic trainer. Yeah, um, he said he was shocked when he went to the the combine and yeah. saw all the medicals and yeah. how many kids, young kids, had like hardware in their legs, exactly. like screws, plates. Yeah, and he's like, I never saw this before, right? Exactly. But it's it's a thing now. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and kind of moving forward to last few questions here. So on a previous podcast you did with uh, I believe it was Mike Robertson, so you talked a little bit about polyvagal theory. Um, will you t- touch on that a little bit more and, and how you can kind of use that in a day-to-day practice? I mean, I, I know my, my friend, uh, Giuseppe Guelli, like he introduced me to the concept and it, it kind of makes sense in terms of you're trying to create safe environments for people to improve and excel. And yeah. you're, you know, the nervous system is very, um, self-regulatory right so mm-hmm. if, if you put somebody in a kind of a fight or flight situation too often or mm-hmm. they you know their brain doesn't operate optimally right mm-hmm. whereas if you put them in a safe space and you're very supportive you know creativity happens a lot better and, mm-hmm. and, and their brain can adapt and manage things better so i mean that's that's how i was taught to coach like charlie mm-hmm. was always about you know you're not picking on people about what they're doing wrong. You're being very positive. You're creating solutions. Yeah. Um, there's no punitive workouts. Like if you do something wrong, let's correct it. I'm not going to make you run. Yeah. 
to have this fear of, of like, oh, I don't want to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Um, because it, and and then even overtly with your coaching, like Mm -hmm. you don't try to spell things out all the time and explain everything, you know, give them one thing to focus on, see if they improve, Mm -hmm. come back, you know, maybe change it a bit, but you're not coaching people, um, you know, not cueing them all the time. You're not providing feedback every rep. You may not even be showing them what the time is on the stopwatch. Like yeah. You might be hiding certain things from mm-hmm. them so that they can express themselves. And there was a good article, uh, I think it was about Australia, uh, Australian uh, soccer after mm-hmm. they got knocked out, right? They didn't make it to the, well, the, the playoff round. Mm-hmm. And they're saying, well, we think uh, this guy was of the opinion that they treat uh, their players like robots, like yeah. we're trying to develop a system. Yeah. And the problem with system players is they're not creative. Mm, yeah, yeah. Right? And so they're not great scorers. They mm-hmm. have trouble scoring because in order to score, yes, you have to be able to kick the ball accurately and all that stuff, mm-hmm. but you have to improvise, right? Most definitely. And it goes back to that thing that we talked about with Charlie. It's like mm-hmm. you have to be adaptable. You have to improvise on the go. Mm-hmm. And it's very hard to do that when your brain isn't open to that, mm-hmm. right? And everything's over-structured. Um, so... And most of the most of the exciting things that happen in sport yeah. are not, you know, pre-programmed. That's it's, it's spontaneous. Yeah. Um, it's a reaction, it right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like instantaneous mm-hmm. and it's reflexive. Mm-hmm. So I think you know that's that's what our jobs are as coaches are a lot of the time. Isn't it goes back to like, are we going to have everything down in an Excel spreadsheet yeah. to the T? Yeah. No, that's that's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, human beings are not linear. Yeah, uh, in their function, right? So uh, that's what I got out of it. Yeah, so. no, that was that was good, and and that's something I think that we can all apply. Like especially these strength coaches in the college setting, like you're saying, right? Everyone wants the Excel sheet, make it look pretty, and the prettier the sheet is, it's like a validation of their their skill, you know. So that's a very important thing that I think um, a lot of people can take away in this realm. So um, last question here. So moving forward, right? I know you're working on a lot of things, but what are some things that you're working on that people might not know about? And how can they kind of follow that um, in your journey? Um, like I said, there's uh, you know the, the EMS stuff on Instagram. Yeah. The um, we're doing this thing with Zoom okay. uh, video conferencing where yeah. uh, we have sort of a list of panel experts, mm-hmm. and then we just in, we'll like do a say like hey uh, next 15 people who send me their email mm-hmm. you can jump on this video conference for free yeah. and you it's like a continuing education mm, okay. thing that's free and accessible and you yeah. know what we'll do is we'll take the full videos and make an archive and maybe mm-hmm. people pay a subscription and they can have access to it mm-hmm. but it's really the whole point of it was you know you can go to a conference yeah. you can read a book you can even watch a webinar mm-hmm. but it's very unidirectional yeah Right, like you just hear information, uh-huh. but at least in this way you can participate. You can ask questions. You can mm-hmm. get feedback. Um, you can see everybody's faces. Mm-hmm. And at first, I thought it was well, it might not work. I don't know. But the more we do it, mm-hmm. I think the more we develop a flow and efficiency with it. And okay. it's, we call it like hashtag Zoom Pop. Yeah. So it's Zoom is the application, and it's performance outreach panel. So for the Pop, mm-hmm. and so I'll I got to get on that today, but I have to send out. This is the topic yeah. this weekend. We do it on Sundays, okay? Just because you know, Sunday morning, and uh, that seems to be time when people are less busy. Yeah. Um, but we'll move it around. Like I have people in Australia that are on that want to get on, so we okay. have to move that to a little later in the day. Uh-huh. I have people from the UK. Some I have a friend who's in Tokyo. Uh-huh. I have you know we have people from all over North America involved. Yeah. yeah. And the idea is make knowledge accessible. Yeah. No, that's and awesome. So, yeah, so, you know, we want to find a way to get, give Uh everybody a chance to be involved. Okay. Now, that's tough, but (laughs) um, just sort of randomly, um, you know, I think on Fridays I'll say, Mm -hmm. like, this is the topic, send me your email, first Mm -hmm. 15 people, and then maybe we come up with a better way of doing it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah. And it seems to be working quite well, and I'll provide more information. And then other than that, um, I'm just working on like some educational materials. Mm-hmm. Um, like I, I, I want to do a series of books that go over how I approach sprint training and how it mm-hmm. applies to you know, track and field. Yeah. Maybe another book on, you know, this is how I do it with sports. Yeah. This is how I integrate weight training. Mm-hmm. This is the importance of tempo running. Yeah. Um, 
and make them, again, I want to keep things short and simple. Yeah. So it's not going to be like this ridiculous super training book that people don't want yeah. to read. It's, it's just too intimidating. Uh -huh. uh, maybe just like 50, 60 pages, handbook. Somebody can look at it and go, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Well, fantastic. So, that, that is awesome stuff. And how can people kind of reach out to you if uh, they have questions or, you know, more, they want to dig deeper on this stuff? Um, on social media, like mm -hmm. Twitter, Facebook, okay. and uh, Instagram, it's just yeah. Derek M. Hansen, middle okay. initials M. Matthew. Mm -hmm. Derek M. Hansen. So, yeah, it's easy to hit me up mm -hmm. on there and, yeah. and message me. Yeah. Um, and then the website I have is sprintcoach.com. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, if you want to look at stuff that mm -hmm. I've put up or even, uh, uh, email me through that, mm -hmm. that website, it's fine. Like I, I'm always very open to, yeah. to receiving questions and helping people out. So, well, this has been fantastic. I can't thank you enough. You know, I've learned a ton and I know the listeners are going to learn a ton as well. So once again, thank you so much for your time and uh, hopefully I can connect again soon in the future. Sounds good Juan. Thanks for having me on and uh, have a good weekend. Thank you. You as well. Take care, man. Once again, thank you to Derek Hansen for sharing his time with me. I know he's got a lot of projects going on, and for him to take the time out of his day to hop on the phone is huge. Thanks again for listening, and if you enjoyed the podcast, please go ahead and give it a five-star review. Um, I know it's it's a little bit extra to ask, but it really does make a difference, and I would really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions or people you want to hear from, go ahead and shoot me an email or a a message on Instagram or Facebook. I would love to hear from you. That's all for today. But until next time, this is the Game Unit Performance Podcast.